Chair open this public hearing for the Joint Standing Committee on the National Broadband Network. This hearing is being held via a combination of video conference and teleconference. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional uh, custodians. On behalf of the committee, I welcome everybody to today's hearing. We are joined by, if I've got this correct, um, uh, Deputy Chair, Ms Templeman, uh, Mr Connolly, uh, Dr Haynes, Mr Mitchell, um, Senator Davey, Senator Farrell, Senator Griff. And has anyone else joined us while I've yeah. been speaking? Chair Alex Antic. Senator Antic. And I'll give you your title, even if you don't want it yourself. Yep. Oh, that's very decent of you. Uh, Fiona Phillips is on the line. Uh, and Ms Phillips, thank you. Um, this is a public hearing and a Hansard transcript of the proceedings is being made. The hearing is also being broadcast via the Australian Parliament House website. I remind witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, uh, you are protected by parliamentary privilege. It's unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee in such action may be treated by the Senate as a contempt. It is also a contempt to give false or misleading evidence to the committee. The committee generally prefers evidence to be given in public, but under the Senate's resolutions, witnesses have the right to request to be heard in private session. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness should state the ground upon which the objection is taken and the committee will determine whether it will insist on an answer. Having regard to the grounds which are claimed, um, if the committee determines to insist on an answer, a witness may request that the answer be given in camera. Such a request, of course, may also be made at any other time. A witness called to answer a question for the first time should state their full name and the capacity in which they appear. Uh, and witness should, should speak, speak clearly, as he doesn't, um, to assist Hansard to record proceedings. I ask all committee members and witnesses mute their microphones unless given the call to speak to ensure that all questions and responses can be heard. If members experience connection problems during the hearing, please contact Secretariat directly or through the WhatsApp group. To assist Hansard, I remind all speakers to state their name prior to speaking. With those formalities over, I welcome representatives of the Australian Telehealth Society. Uh, I understand we have Ms Jackie Plunkett, Ms Kim Ford, and Professor Anthony Smith. Thank you for taking the time to give evidence today. I understand the information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. Uh, for the Hansard record, could you each please state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? My name is Jackie Plunkett. I am um, here on behalf of the Australasian Telehealth Society as the president of the society. My name is Kim Ford. I'm here as a representative of the Australasian Telehealth Society as a committee member. Yeah, and good morning. Professor Anthony Smith, I'm the Director of the Centre for Online Health at the University of Queensland in Brisbane and also a founding member of the Australasian Telehealth Society. Uh, thank you, Ms Plunkett, Ms Ford and Professor Smith. I now invite you to make a short opening statement and at the conclusion of those remarks, I'll invite members of the committee to ask questions. Thank you very much for asking us to um, uh, provide uh, a statement through to this committee. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, uh, Jackie Plunkett, my colleague, Jackie Plunkett, President of Australasian Telehealth Society. Um, firstly, I'd like to introduce myself and my colleague. Um, my, uh, my name is Jackie. I, have been the president of the Australasian Telehealth Society for the past six years, five, five and a half to six years. My prior experience and bringing um, that expertise to this is as the director of telehealth, uh, having implemented uh, telehealth into the Northern Territory, the founding uh, implementation within Tasmania and also across the um, a central Victorian region. I'm also currently working in primary care um, as the general manager of a series of regional GP practices. So I also bring to this uh, inquiry that expertise. I might pass to my colleagues and then I might just give you a quick overview of 
the society and um, what telehealth is. So I'll go firstly to Kim Ford. Hello, my name is Kim Ford. I'm the Assistant Director of Nursing for the Tasmanian Department of Health. I've been working in the telehealth area for four years and have established and oversee the running of the telehealth program within the Department of Health for the state of Tasmania. Thank you. Thanks, Jacqueline and Kim. And a little bit of commentary for me. Um, so I've been involved in the telehealth space for probably more than 20 years now and also involved in some of the initial NBN related projects which were aimed at doing a number of things including improving access to healthcare around the country. Um, so my centre is particularly interested in and has a lot of experience in uh, the area of telehealth research, service delivery and also in teaching. Each of those avenues are absolutely critical for us to truly understand the benefits of telehealth in Australia. Uh, one reason is obviously the distances, but the other reason is the disparity which exists between health services and patients, not only those in country areas, but also those uh, that happen to be in city areas that find it very difficult to access um, a particular service. So I'm very interested in understanding how a range of different uh, important pieces of the entire puzzle can be put together to make healthcare more accessible. And our priority area, of course, is the area of telehealth, and that's our primary area of expertise. We've seen some massive changes as a result of COVID-19. So telehealth uptake um, has increased exponentially. Uh, if you look at that either from a primary care perspective or from a hospital or community health setting, um, all of a sudden telehealth has become a household name. Uh, from my own perspective, as I said before, I've been working in this area for over two decades now. And I don't think any marketing campaign could have achieved what we have achieved, um, despite the unfortunate circumstances of COVID and the pandemic. Uh, all of a sudden, everybody seems to understand to a certain degree what telehealth is. There's quite a lot that needs to be done to make telehealth truly uh, sustainable. And we're very interested in understanding those and working in those areas. Um, but from an NBM perspective, um, I'd be cautious to say that NBN is the only sole reason for a successful telehealth service, but it is an important requirement. Um, and there's an important uh, requirement, not only to make sure we've got effective telecommunications around the country, um, but there's also an important requirement that we have um, a well-trained and supported health service. And we also have an informed patient base or consumer base that truly understand what telehealth is and how it can sincerely help them. So I'm happy to, answer questions about our broader role in telehealth um, and perhaps give you some of our experience in that context if there are any questions. But Jackie will probably talk a little bit more about the submission that was made and what we believe are some of the, perhaps some of the hurdles um, associated with telehealth, but also what we believe um, the NBN can contribute as well. And hopefully that will be informative for this committee as well. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, thank you for those um, opening remarks. Uh, just so you understand how we conduct uh, our business, as we um, we seek to be every, uh, 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 fair and even-handed, and that's my responsibility to make time, make sure time is shared equitably. Uh, we have effectively three groupings in the committee. We have members who uh, uh, are from minor or independent parties, or mi minor parties or independent members. Um, ALP members and coalition members. So what we do is we segregate time. Um, I'm going to hand over to um, uh, Dr. Haynes and Senator Griff to um, begin. Um, they'll have you for about 40 minutes or 35 minutes. Um, uh, the ALP members will have you for about 35 minutes and then we'll round out with 35 minutes from the coalition members. I, I just wanted you to understand that so it doesn't seem you know, when I say the time's up, you'll understand why. Uh, over to you, Dr. Haynes or Senator Griff. Thank you very much, Chair, and, and thank you so much to our witnesses for coming today and for the fine work you're doing for health care across our nation. Um, can I ask, uh, please, uh, your impressions, um, particularly for rural and regional Australians, where uh, we know that uh, mental health is a is a, uh, an incredibly important issue, and that the um, 
impact of mental health and the outcomes uh, that uh, rural and regional Australians um, experience in regard to access to services is much poorer than those uh, for people in metropolitan centres. Would you comment for me, please, um, about uh, the effectiveness of telehealth in addressing that really long-term and, and serious problem in rural Australia? I might ask uh, Jackie Plunkett, uh, Telehealth Society, I might ask Kim Ford um, from Tasmania to respond to that. Thanks, Jackie. Kim Ford from Tasmanian Department of Health. Telepsychiatry has been one of the early adopters for telehealth and there's a strong history of using telehealth for support for mental health clients in all areas, particularly important in the rural remote areas, but what happens is connectivity is an issue. If the connectivity is there so they can't make a good connection, then the service it's really important, especially with mental health clients, especially those who have psychotic illnesses, that there is a trust in the system. If there's not the trust in the system and there are glitches in it, it doesn't work or it falls out, that can actually exacerbate people's mental health issues with their paranoia or their anxiety. So having a reliable connection and a secure connection is very important. The telepsychiatry and not just in the medical sense but also from allied health and psychology as well is particularly important in supporting people in the mental health sector also in areas like um, early childhood development supporting young mothers we work with our child health and parenting services to provide parenting sessions and support sessions for young mothers in rural and remote areas that's another area of mental health it doesn't sit under mental health but is very important as well and looking at group settings and um, any sort of support that's needed in that area. Um, Jackie could you just um, let me know um, you said you said there's all, technical issues can be a problem to uptake and trust and effectiveness. Um, we know of course that uh, the biggest problem we have in healthcare in rural and regional Australia is the maldistribution of our health professionals and probably almost no more so than in psychiatry. Um, are there other barriers outside of the effectiveness of the technology? Um, can you comment about the appropriateness, for example, of, of the available Medicare uh, items um, in, in telehealth for, for mental health particularly, and, and I'd be really keen to hear from, from the other witnesses about uh, the appropriateness of, of Medicare provider items more broadly in, in um, the effectiveness of telehealth. Um, thank you. Jackie Plunkett. Um, the, to answer your first part of the question, there are a lot of emerging apps um, that are coming out. So trust in the system, and traditional video conferencing or even telephone mental health consultations are certainly something that um, has been around since the introduction of the MDS items, if not even before, um, for specialist consultations. Um, they are the, there are emerging that actually are also being quite effective um, that can actually, in a remote monitoring perspective, help to manage patients. So, for example, um, in Indigenous communities, it's culturally appropriate um, for Aboriginal patients to be to have a mobile phone. Actually, the number of Indigenous patients um, is, uh, with mobile phones is, is um, quite impressive. Uh, just a little side note, when I moved to the Northern Territory uh, in the early 80s, um, our Aboriginal people were under trees getting a shave. When I left um, five years ago, our Aboriginal people were sitting around PowerPoints to charge their phones. So it's a very big culture shift um, in a generation. So using these apps, to assist with mental health has been really quite crucial. Um, and another way of looking at 
how services can be delivered. Unfortunately, Medicare doesn't cover remote patient monitoring at all. And um, tapping into that side of uh, health is difficult and is really one of the next steps beyond sustainment of the current MBS items. Now, the MBS items as a whole, um, there's a lot of um, fear at the moment that those items are going to be withdrawn as of the 30th of September. Here we are almost halfway through September and we haven't heard anything about the longer term um, availability of those numbers. And it's quite crucial that they remain. Um, for telehealth to grow, uh, I think one of the terms of the journey is out of the body and our consumers and our practitioners understand what telehealth is. Um, as Anthony said before, no change management, no marketing campaign could have changed, made this as effective as it is. Um, and it's very important that we be assuming whether those numbers will be continued and in what capacity. Mm. Um, do I take it from that that I think, uh, Kim, you wanted to say something, did you? Yes, please. Kim Ford here. I've got a few things to say about MBS, which probably doesn't surplies my colleagues. MBS, one, one of the structural barriers that was there for telehealth prior to COVID was the very complicated process that needed to be undertaken to gain consent to draw. It involved email item numbers and getting emails back from to consent from patients. So often that trial, that loop wasn't completed, so billing wasn't completed. So that was a real barrier. With the advent of COVID-19 MBS numbers, we've been able to get, the, the clinician can get verbal consent from the patient document that in the clinical notes, and that's sufficient evidence to build. Now, that's been a real deal breaker for physicians because there's not the follow-up, there's not the added admin, there's not the extra steps in the process to actually get the billing complete. And that billing, we all need money to pay our bills. Billing is a big, is a big driver. So that has really helped with the adoption of telehealth, both in the public and the private sector. So that is one thing I wouldn't like to see go. Um, the availability of telehealth beyond the rural and remote areas and in the metropolitan areas with COVID has also been a very big boon for patients as well. Yes, patients in rural and remote areas benefit greatly from telehealth, but so do patients in the not so rural and remote areas, in the metropolitan areas. If I'm a mother with half a dozen children, I'm trying to get you know kids at school or I'm an elderly person with disability and I've got to get someone to take me to an appointment or I'm a patient in an aged care facility. If I can do that appointment by telehealth, even if I'm less than 15 kilometres in an RA2 or 3 area from my doctor, I'm talking from the public sector because that's my area, in, to be more than 15 kilometres from the specialist. So if you're not within those boundaries, Telehealth is still really valuable no matter where you live. Mm. The other thing to talk about when we're looking at funding, and this is in the public sector and in the hospital, the acute sector, we need to look at funding that's not just MBS driven because most funding in the acute sector and hospitals is not MBS driven. So we need to look at the IPA funding, the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority and the activity-based funding. And MBS is more directed towards outpatients, telehealth covers the whole spectrum of care. So if you've got someone that's receiving telehealth because they're having a stroke and they're getting remote assistance, someone's reading their scans, deciding whether they need blood therapy, we need some way of structurally putting that in our funding model. If you have someone in a rural or regional emergency room, getting support from a emergency doctor in an urban centre, we need some way of funding that, not just tacking it on to their additional, additional activity for that facility. So we need some way of addressing those funding gaps. So MBS goes 
investing the funding in the primary sector, but we also need to look at funding in the acute and inpatient public sector. MBS tends to tend to medical practitioners. Telehealth, there's a big uptake from allied health and nursing in those other areas of healthcare. So we need to look at ways of funding those, both in the private and in the public sector. Because allied health, is, we're running a quite a successful tele-rehab program. So patients that are rural remote and can go home, they can have their apps, as Jackie was talking about. They have regular contact with allied health professionals to make sure that program is going well. That saves them staying in hospital but we need to look at funding. We have a cardiac rehabilitation program that we're running under, the, which is run by nurses. We do antenatal uh, stuff. So it's much broader. MBS is, is pivotal in the primary sector and also to some extent in the public sector, but we need to look more broadly at the funding model for telehealth and how we approach that. Great, thank, thank, thanks Jackie. Um, um, I'm not sure. Oh, yes, we've got another contribution. <laughs> no, no, sorry about that. Look, thank you. I agree with both Jackie and Kim on those notes. And um, I just wanted to uh, reinforce the point that telehealth lends itself perfectly well for people who require mental health services. So historically, uh, in the telehealth space for more than 30 or 40 years, telepsychiatry and telepsychology psychology applications have been uh, very well reported in the literature. Um, there are a couple of things that lend itself particularly well is, is one that telehealth means you're not physically there and it's not a hands-on consultation, generally speaking, um, but it certainly is a consultation where the visuals are quite important, where you're interacting with a patient. So that's where telehealth and particularly video conferencing is very useful. Um, so, so it works well. There's also the challenge that we've got with providing mental health services to anybody and that challenge is related to stigma. And we've been doing a lot of work out in some of the country areas of Queensland, particularly in the Western Downs, where uh, there are serious concerns, obviously, for farmers, for example, um, serious concerns regarding unemployment or low productivity. All of those kind of factors with suicide prevention strategies uh, being managed mainly with telehealth, whether it be telephone support, uh, group video conference sessions or direct consultations. Um, the advantage is that there's an element of privacy where a person can have a, an appointment in their own house. Um, but even then we find that there's still stigma attached and unfortunately there are people who are finding it very difficult to reach out for services with mental health conditions. So um, telehealth is certainly bridging a gap in that sense. From a Medicare perspective, I think the funding that's been introduced for COVID-19 um, has been an excellent move. Um, it certainly resulted in a huge amount of activity around the country. And um, some of the skeptics would probably say, well, look, that's just going to cause a massive budget blowout. But we've actually done some studies to demonstrate that whilst activity has increased exponentially, the, the net result of that hasn't been too significant and hasn't been so concerning. So the benefit has been a greater amount of services delivered and it hasn't created that, that scary budget problem, which some people were worried about. Further work has to be done to actually look at the services delivered as a result of COVID. And when I say that, I mean, there are perhaps services that may be termed low value care. And the low value care services are those that may be deemed essential, but we need to think about putting a price. So a reaction to COVID is to put in some Medicare funding to enhance access to telehealth. Um, but if we're really interested in trying to think about um, providing funding for particular services, I think further work is needed to actually explore that. And what I mean by that is rather than just have a single fee attached to a consultation that is delivered by either phone or video conference, and we've seen in the Medicare data, for example, that over 92% of consultations are currently being done by the telephone. Personally, I'd like to see that increase, but there are a whole lot of logistical challenges that we need to put into place to, to solve in order for video conferencing to be used more. But what it does show us that there are services that can be delivered and historically um, we obviously live in a fee for service arrangement where as a consumer of healthcare, we, we have to go to a facility and swipe our card or pay a fee and receive a service. Whereas the telehealth has really disrupted that and it's forcing us to kind of see a totally different way of providing healthcare. So I'm hoping that even beyond COVID-19, we start realising that there are other ways of providing healthcare. I want to make sure that we have evidence and research built into that 
Um, I hope that it's not just a reactive, um, let's just try and see if this works. We, we have uh, amazing expertise in the country. Um, Australia is well leading in terms of its desire to do telehealth. Um, we've got the conditions in place and the challenges in place in terms of dislocation of services between city and country areas. But we're also recognising the, the disparity that exists between people in urban areas. And I'd just like to highlight particularly our Indigenous health services. You know, that's another massive area where many of the projects we've been able to establish over the last 15 years have demonstrated the importance of providing services as close to home as possible. So from an Indigenous perspective, providing um, expert telehealth services within an Aboriginal controlled medical service and having them link up to a specialist in a place like Brisbane means that that person and that family can be attending an area where they're comfortable, they understand who's around them, they're well supported, they don't have to pay for trouble, they don't have to be living in a city which is obscure and unknown to them and scary. Um, but at the same time, the local community staff are being supported through the telephone consultation. Everybody is benefiting from the interaction. And at the end of the day, we're not missing out on that. But unfortunately, we see many examples where people are missing out on services because uh, one is they don't understand they can access telehealth services. Uh, two, our health system is not configured to provide telehealth services routinely. And we also don't have a health workforce which is well informed about how to do telehealth. And I think that's another priority area. So it sounds to me like a recommendation from this might be to improve the education more broadly about access to telehealth and potentially even in our um, uh, education of our uh, professional work workforce as well. Well, um, that's an excellent, that's an excellent yeah. suggestion because I think at the moment, uh, we, we finished, we've just finished writing a telehealth curriculum and the curriculum is designed for our pre-registration medical nursing and allied health students, which I believe would be a value around the whole country. Um, but we, we need to tackle it from a pre-registration perspective to make sure we've got our next generation workforce ready. And we also need to be mindful of our current workforce and to make sure that they're well supported and, and they have the appropriate training to provide telehealth service as well. I guess the third arm is making sure we've got a, a well-informed consumer base and that our general public are well aware of telehealth and they understand exactly what it can do and what it can't do. Uh, and they know how to interact appropriately with that. So I think okay. that's really important. Right. Um, Hel Helen, yep. uh, last thing I want to be is an arbiter between yourself and Senator. No, no, I, it's arbiter to Sterling now. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Witnesses, can I just ask when you're not on the line, if you could mute your lines, because there's a bit of feedback going back to the people on the telephone telephones and can I say that Dr uh, um, Katie Allen joined us at the beginning of this conference but at the conclusion of my introduction so over to you Senator Griff. Yes thank you Chair. Look I'm interested in the first case as to what proportion of consultations and I know it's it's changed a lot obviously during the COVID period but what proportion of consultations would uh, uh, generally represent Sorry, can you just repeat that question? And there was some interruption there. I didn't hear the question. Sorry. Okay. What, what proportion of consultations would telehealth generally represent before and uh, during COVID out of a typical practice? Okay. I can, I can tell you almost exactly the answer based on the Medicare data that's being produced at the moment. So there are some Medicare summary reports which have been developed and available through our website, which intentionally is to inform people of what's happened prior to and during COVID. Um, now, just before COVID, um, you'd be interested to know that about 0.2% of all consultations were being done by telehealth, and currently about 20% of all consultations have been done by telehealth as a result of COVID. So in terms of numbers, if you're interested in numbers, um, pre-COVID, we're looking at around 250,000 to 270,000 consultations per year. Um, since March this year, we've done over 21 million telehealth consultations. Now, 92% of those are by phone. Right. I mean, that's 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 one hell of a one hell of an increase, isn't it? Which is, I, I can see why uh, you know your members uh, you know would be particularly pleased, and of course, it's given uh, the public an option that um, they very much needed. But just going back to what you just said about 92% via the phone. 
So does, is that, based on that, are you saying 8% is via the internet? 8% is by video conference. Okay. And um, is there a, a noticeable difference in quality? I mean, are, are patients often having to revert from video to phone? I mean, you know, are you finding it that it's, you know, it's working effectively for people? Uh, the, the experience that I've seen so far is that GPs are opting to mainly use a telephone because it's much more convenient. Uh, some GPs are reporting um, some difficulties with connection, but I, I wouldn't blame just the internet connection. What I would blame are a number of system difficulties. <coughs> For example, connectivity with medical records between the patient, sharing records, scheduling processes that aren't um, in place yet. Um, e-scripting, e so being able to, you know, describe a script and send that to the patient. Now, technically, a lot of these functions are available, but they're, they're not well connected yet. So we haven't got a similar system. And I think in order for um, video com consultation to be used much more, we need to make sure that we have that seamless system in place where GPs don't have to think, well, which option is going to be easier? Um, what the numbers do show us is that there is a considerable amount of work that general practitioners can do by phone. And um, and I don't downplay that because I think the phone can be used effectively for tele-triage. Um, and that's been very important, especially during COVID when we're trying to um, put health, prof health professionals in a safer spot, you know, reduce the, you know, the risk of transmission of COVID-19. Um, but we also um, can use telephone co consultation as a way of deciding whether or not we absolutely have to see that patient in person. Um, but the, the, the reason why video consultation is not being used, I suspect, is, is mainly because um, it's considered a fairly clunky um, process. Um, it requires multiple different video conference platforms. Um, it doesn't always work. So if I was in a busy general practice um, with, a, with a consistent lineup of patients, and I had to contemplate spending half an hour or 45 minutes for a five minute consult by video, when I knew that I could achieve the same thing by phone, then I'd be opting for the phone. So um, we need to make sure the systems are in place and currently not all the systems are in place. Okay. I mean, your, your submission calls for a national telehealth strategy built around the NBN. Can you outline what you see this encompassing? Um, <clears throat> Really, it's a lot of the modules that um, Anthony, Jackie Trumpet, um, a lot of the modules that Anthony has outlined. One of the key components of that strategy is also the discussion around a help network. Um, there is, for example, Arnet that is available for education, which is quite successful. A similar network around health would be very valuable. And it would also help to address some of the um, e-health issues that are happening at the moment. So, for example, um, there's a, we've been trying for years to get secure messaging, um, whereas in other countries who have a closed health network simply use secure emails to transfer patient records. It's something that's of huge benefit to the health sector um, that could be leveraged through a health network. Other components of a strategy would be how we could integrate in other components such as uh, remote monitoring, how we would address issues such as ED, um, uh, ED support for regional areas. At the moment, there's a view that a local uh, regional hub can provide ED support to the whole region. Um, without any extra funding or with minimal additional funding. We've done a study here out of Bendigo that has um, said that if we were to take on all of the ED cases from just our region, it would double the number of um, patients that our ED would have to, um, to uh, cope with and we're already coping with those walking through the doors. So a strategy would actually look at some of those um, uh, barriers and put in strategies to help to address them. They could be things such as, uh, for example, in WA, there's a regional um, uh, emergency hub, uh, which is 
quite successful and does all of the regional um, emergency medicine uh, provision. So it is really about addressing what's within the private as well as the public sector and how we integrate in health into that. Are uh, telehealth appointments uh, cheaper for patients or are they the same price as a normal medical consult? They would be cheaper. Um, the, the, the interesting thing with telehealth is the benefit quite often accrues to the citizen, to the patient. Um, as Kim alluded to earlier, um, busy mums not having to pack up all the kids and bring them in. Um, people in remote, remote areas not having to travel in uh, as we speak. My, my husband has traveled from Bendigo to Melbourne for a cardiology appointment. Entirely frustrating given that the, he's not going to touch that patient. So there are a lot of, um, so whilst some can accrue to the health system, most of the benefit accrues to the patient. Does the, uh, does the actual cost vary depending on when the consult takes place as in the time of day? Uh, as far as the, no, the cost doesn't change. Um, for example, I've got, um, I've got uh, GPs who will quite often do a consultation after hours for patients for their results because they can do it from home. Um, they've got all of their securities in place and so it's actually the same cost. Um, Kim wanted to say something. Kim? Kim Ford from Tasmania here, just a couple of comments. You, For us down here in the public sector in our specialist outpatients, we had a 1200% increase in video conference telehealth between March and June with the COVID pandemic. The other interesting thing we noted was that our did not attend rate dropped from 10 to 15% to about 2% because of the convenience for people to be able to have their appointment wherever they were, there was no travel involved. You will have seen in the submission the social savings around telehealth that March to August in the public sector in Tasmania alone, we saved 503,000 kilometres of patient travel, 6,300 hours of travel time, 92 metric tonnes of carbon emission from reduced travel. Now, they're quite significant social benefits. That also means that people don't have to take days off work to travel. They don't have to get carers in. They don't have to take kids out of school. They don't have to, like people in our Bass Strait Islands, if they come to the main, what we call the mainland, they don't have to have three days away from their home for that appointment. They can go either in their home or their local public health facility have that appointment for the 10 minutes it takes and return to their daily business. So you can see that there are a lot of social benefits. The decrease in the DNA was quite surprising and we've seen a trend as we've returned to face-to-face -face consultations that the trend in DNA is actually going back up again. So that's, that's an interesting phenomenon that has been witnessed throughout the country. Yes, I mean, regarding uh, those stats that you just uh, quoted relating to Tasmania, can you uh, perhaps on notice provide us with uh, how many patient consultations and how many doctors those numbers actually relate to? And uh, will you have that information available for other states at some time? Uh, I, I personally won't, but um, we can look at perhaps getting that information. Certainly. <laughs> We can try, Jackie Plunkett, um, we can try to uh, get uh, as much as we can. It's in states where there's federated um, healthcare systems such as Victoria and New South Wales, it's quite difficult. But in states where there is a um, whole of government management with Northern Territory, South Australia, WA um, and Tasmania, it is easier and certainly Queensland. Okay. So Kim Ford and again, that brings up one of my points around the fact that anything that's not Commonwealth reported is difficult to track and look at performance. We have very strong, strong um, reporting.
reporting to the Commonwealth around elective surgery, but we don't have any reporting to the Commonwealth around outpatient. If there was Commonwealth reporting, this data would be readily available. Right, okay. Has uh, NBN actively promoted or engaged with uh, practitioners and specialists you know, moving to provide telehealth services? No, not to my knowledge. And we've got other shaking heads here. Sorry about that. Uh, it was my uh, um, just just generally as, as a view. Now I know COVID very much changed things in terms of uh, certainly the volumes of uh, uh, telehealth consultations that you undertook. But is telehealth generally more appropriate for an initial consultation with a GP or specialist more than, or was face to face more appropriate? Is it is, is it more appropriate, you know, for ongoing uh, treatment with a patient, or do you? as a group see it as being uh, valid for all types? I'll, I'll start with answering that, but it's Anthony here. Um, telehealth, you know, we, we used to say that telehealth was particularly good if you were familiar with the patient and, and clinicians often said they liked that because they already had some level of rapport um, with the patient, particularly a patient with a chronic illness. So it was easy to say, look, instead of coming back to me every three months, let's catch up and, and see each other online. And, you know, someone with diabetes or another chronic health condition, and that lends itself really, really well. Um, but some clinicians will prefer that, but many are now realizing that telehealth in the first instance is actually quite valuable to make sure that we kind of truly understand what this patient needs before we even make them move. And in the hospital system, that works especially well because you know, often patients will be referred to a specialist and I've seen so many different examples where they they travel down from Bundaberg or from Mount Isa and they're, they're lining up to see a specialist and outpatients and unfortunately they're, they're in the wrong clinic because the condition hasn't been articulated and the description or the referral hasn't been accurate enough. So my, my kind of thought on this is that telehealth should be used in the first instance. You know, it should be step one, you know, do telehealth first. Um, about 10 years ago, we eventually changed some patient travel forms to actually put in a little tick box to make clinicians think about whether or not uh, telehealth is an option. Um, but I, I think what we should be doing is turning that around completely by um, having a little tick box to say, is travel an absolute essential option? You know, we, we should be seeing them by video or getting the information in advance, and that would be a much more effective um, process. Um, I just wanted to also comment on the point that Kim was making. Kim's highlighted a very important point that um, some of the numbers I've been giving you and some of the activity we've been talking about has been falling and talking and reflecting what's happening in general practice in the, in the private sector. But there's a massive amount of work happening in each of the states. And I do like that question about finding out what is each of the state areas doing in their telehealth space. I know in Queensland, you know, remarkable progress, similar to what Tasmania has done with hundreds of thousands of video consultations. And it's because the Queensland Health Service is configured so well with a support network, um, very well described processes, and each of the health services are able to do that. Most of those services go out to other hospitals, not in general practice for some of the logistical challenges I explained before. And the second point I just want to make was about Medicare and the gap fee payment. So there was a question about whether or not after hours support attracts uh, greater fees, and it doesn't. And I guess one of the limitations which has been commented on at the moment is that from a general practice perspective, the use of the Medicare item number for telehealth currently does not permit the GP to charge a gap fee payment. So they perceive that as a loss of revenue. Um, some interesting work that we're doing at the moment is to truly understand from a patient perspective, knowing that many of the benefits relate to the patient is, what is the patient's willingness to pay? So in the conventional system, in, in many uh, clinics, you might go to see a GP and naturally pay a gap fee payment. So from a patient perspective, not having to take time off work or pick up the kids from school um, or, or have that inconvenience, I'd be willing to pay for that inconvenience. So it's truly, a, we, we need to understand what patients are willing to pay, but I don't see anything wrong with introducing a gap fee payment, provided that there's always an opportunity for fulfilling arrangements for those who may not be in a position to afford it. Because the last thing we want to do with telehealth, and this is another problem we've got to consider, is we don't want to create a divide between 
those that can do telehealth, those that technically have access to it, have access to networking or the equipment needed for it, and those that don't. And I think we need to be very mindful that as we're improving our health system, and that's what I believe we are doing, we truly want to make sure that we are providing health services to everybody and not trying to isolate them or divide them. Excellent. Uh, I've received a note from Mr. Griff that he's um, concluded his questions just in time, but all I understand, Senator Griff, you have some that you'll submit on notice? Uh, yes, Chair. Excellent. Uh, over to you, Ms. Templeman. You have through until um, uh, 10 20 your time. Thank you. And uh, thank you um, to all the witnesses for the picture you're painting for us. Um, there are going to be four uh, Labor hey, Darren, members and senators who want to ask questions. Can I just ask if we can have quite succinct answers because otherwise the four of us won't be able to get through the range of things that we'd love to uh, explore with you. Um, I'm actually going to hand to Senator Farrell just to start off the questioning. Uh, thanks, uh, Ms Templeton, uh, and thank you uh, for our witnesses coming along today. Um, can I uh, just go back to uh, the last uh, witness and you were starting to um, talk about um, how uh, the charging uh, system uh, works, um, and I just want to make sure I understood you correctly. Um, you said that for a telehealth consultation, um, the doctor can't uh, charge more than the um, standard consultation rate. Is that is that correct? Did I get that right? Yeah, that's the, the Medicare funding that's available for COVID-19 is a bulk billing arrangement. Right. Um, right. It's Jackie Plunkett here. I just might need to make a correction there. In actual fact, um, for under uh, 16 and anyone with a health care card, you're not allowed to do any private billing, whereas in GP practice, um, you would normally or, or could normally for particularly those older. Um, for normal patients who are coming, you can actually, and we do actually charge a gas bill. Um, so minor correction there. But all um, the COVID-19 related Medicare numbers, you can't. Uh, okay, so can, can we get... Yeah, specialists can, can, can charge that for telehealth. Okay, so I, I had a sort of personal experience uh, just, just recently. I had to um, uh, get some scripts. Um, I couldn't get in to see the doctor. We did a telehealth consultation and normally I get um, <clears throat> charged um, extra but on this occasion I didn't. Is that because the doctor is prohibited from charging that or could could the doctor have um, billed me um, uh, something extra? Um, no, the, the doctor can't the doctor can't charge you additional fees in that circumstance. Um, right. As Kim mentioned before um, specialists who are doing telehealth consultations are able to charge a gap fee and there's also the ability in the allied health and nurse practitioner areas to ah, okay so uh, from a general the, practitioner the, perspective that be available. The, okay so from a GP there, there can be no um, extra charge but with a specialist there can be is that have I got that right that's correct that's yeah, correct okay and um, uh, does the doctor um, simply put that application in? Because I've not received a bill for this. So, um, not that I'm that worried, but um, so do they simply process that? Is there some... Uh, look, I, I've, I've had a similar experience and it's bulk billed and managed in the practice. So right. uh, the practice right. will administer that. that fee. You don't need to do anything. Right, right. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, uh, now, look, it's, for all of the reasons that um, you've expressed, it has appeared to be quite a, a success. What do we think will happen post-COVID? Um, will 
um, <clears throat> will we continue along this path or will we go back to uh, where um, uh, where we were before COVID? Jackie Plunkett, Telehealth Society. Um, it's my opinion that if the MBS items in primary care are supported ongoing, which we get to hear about, um, yes, there will certainly be a, a longer term uh, vision for telehealth. In the specialist space, I believe it will grow um, because the communication around telehealth is out there and um, the, the stigma about it um, is gone or going. <coughs> Kim Ford here from Tasmania. We're seeing in the outpatient space in the public hospitals a return to face-to-face -to appointments, -face but there is still a level of telehealth that I think will be sustained. And the emphasis now is for us is on security. So should there be another wave or another pandemic or another situation, we're making sure we're prepared for that continuity. Uh, now, I think it's uh, um, Deputy Chair here. That was Don's last question. And I'm going to ask uh, Brian Mitchell to pick up from there, please. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Thank you, witnesses. Um, so I'm not sure if it's Miss Ford or, uh, or Dr Ford, um, but you mentioned uh, the, the telehealth services in Tasmania. I'm just wondering <laughs> what have been the challenges with telehealth in Tasmania in terms of the MBN and and connectivity, um, you know, what's worked well, what hasn't, you know, what could be improved? So, thank you, it's Ms Ford. The connectivity is a significant barrier in our rural and remote areas because we just can't get the bandwidth that supports video. Video is quite internet or bandwidth hungry. So we're not able to get the certainty of connection and Doctors and nurses and allied health are doctors and nurses and allied health. They're not technicians. They don't want to spend the first five to ten minutes of a <coughs> sorting out technical problems only to find that the connectivity is not good enough for, and then turn to phone. So even in some of our more what we might think are um, inhabited areas, you know, Hewenville, that aren't really regional or remote, we have some connectivity issues around broadband. And even some of our facilities, like on the West Coast and some of the Bass Strait Islands, even the connections and the connectivity into the public health facilities is not sufficient to undertake good broadband or good internet connections with telehealth. Is, I mean, I don't want to take up the, the time of the committee on this, but is, the, is a lot of this data available? Is it being annotated anywhere in a report or how would you get more information on the sorts of challenges you're facing in those areas? Uh, and uh, I imagine it's all being documented in terms of where those challenges are and how many and that sort of thing. We can look at fail, failed um, connections or connect. It's a bit hard because if the connection fails, or you don't even consider setting up a telehealth appointment because you know there are problems. But I know NBN should be able to provide some data around where they have connectivity and where they don't. Well, look, if you wouldn't mind, Ms Ford, I'll, I'll, if I could ask a question on notice to you, um, if you're able to collate whatever information is available to you in your capacity, and if you could provide that mm -hmm. to the committee, on this issue, um, in terms of what those issues are, um, what the, you know, where those problems are, that would be very helpful, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you, Hugh and Bill, anybody who doesn't know Tasmania, it is a very <coughs> sizable regional town in the south of the state. And if that's having connection issues, I can only imagine what places like Avoca and Maina and other places have. So um, thanks for that. Yeah. Look, I, I just want to take the um, witnesses back to the 2011 submission um, that Telehealth Society put in. Um, and you asked in that submission that a national telehealth strategy be developed um, 
And I'm just wondering what work has been done since then on developing a national telehealth strategy um, and who's responsible for it. Jackie Plunkett, um, Senator, uh, the short answer is yes and no. Um, no, there has been no specific telehealth strategy that has been done. However, under the, the Australian Digital Health Agency um, digital health strategy, there is a component that does address telehealth to some degree. Um, this actually needs to be expanded further. Um, and a proper strategy around public health develop. Who, who would you like to see develop that strategy? Who's who's responsible for it? Um, that's the tricky bit. Uh, so we've been trying to get movement in telehealth for 10, 20 years. We seem to have more uh, traction from a political perspective than we do from a government perspective. So we have um, asked, for example, MBS billing for specialists. The MBS billing got put in by uh, the then Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, as an election promise. Um, MBS billing for uh, primary care uh, has been put in by Minister Hunt under COVID. So anything to do with the advancement of telehealth has actually generally been done by politicians, strangely enough. Um, so, so if I can just jump in there, are you, and I'll be blunt about this, are you saying that you're hitting resistance within the bureaucracy? Absolutely. Okay, so, so what needs to happen? Um, there needs to actually be um, someone responsible for telehealth as a portfolio. Um, it gets shunted from place to place. It gets put into IT um, in almost all cases, and it is not an IT issue. It is a clinical redesign issue. And if I could, I'm not sure whether you're able to answer this, but what is driving that um, that resistance? Do you think is it a, a sense of uh, misunderstanding about what telehealth is or does? Or is there a sense of, you know, I'm not sure what the term would be, but amongst the, the senior bureaucrats who decide these things, is there a, a sense that it's just, it's just not that, in, that important? I'll get Kim to answer that one. Kim? I think that basically telehealth is an enabler for healthcare. We need to have reward and incentives for innovative models of care. I don't know whether you're online previously when I was talking about the fact that there's no reporting around telehealth activity from the Commonwealth level. Money and attention and development of programs tends to go into Commonwealth reported data driven activities. So if we can get some something happening where states are responsible to the Commonwealth provide for, for providing service, we're going to get much more buy-in. And we need to sell it on the basis of equity to healthcare, because at the moment, that's what telehealth can provide, whether you're metropolitan, rural, wherever you are, telehealth provides equity of service. And it provides equity of service, not just in the primary care space, but in the acute care and subacute space as well, whether you're an inpatient or an outpatient. You know, we're setting up so that people in hospitals such as Scottsdale, which you'd be familiar with, can can receive support from clinicians at Launceston General Hospital so they can receive their care closer to home. We need some sort of reporting to make states accountable to deliver. All right. And one last one for me, if that's all right, Chair. Um, just to catch you, I'm not sure who, who's best to answer this, but in terms of the brief of this committee with NBN and, and connectivity, uh, what is the single most important thing the, uh, the parliament or the government needs to do uh, to ensure that the NBN can properly meet telehealth requirements. Can I, I think the, if I try to make that answer as simple as possible, I, I think making NBN or telecommunications accessible to everybody and also making NBN and telecommunications affordable to everybody. Um, can you put some more meat on those bones? Yeah, look, I, I I think from the perspective of the NBN, obviously the connectivity is very, very important. And 
we're, we're still experiencing problems with people trying to access services in not only regional country areas, but also metropolitan areas. And, um, and in some areas we've seen examples where people may have access to the NBN, but they can't afford it. So we're, we're providing mental health services to people who are parking in the McDonald's car park. We're, we're providing mental health services to people who are trying to use the local library, but the library shuts at six and therefore a group session can't be held after 6 p.m. You know, so we're, we're working with families that share a mobile phone. So those kind of situations where, you know, I, I think affordability and accessibility are again, just the most important things. Jackie Plunkett, I'd also like to add to that uh, what we were talking about earlier, which is a um, national health network similar to the RNET network for education. Um, places like Northern Territory, WA, Tasmania, um, patients um, who can't actually have access to telehealth services should be able to be able to go into the local health um, clinic in their community if their clinics don't have appropriate connectivity, then you know that the um, access to healthcare is even reduced further. And it's it's almost a bit of an embarrassment that the um, local health clinic doesn't have adequate um, bandwidth to be able to provide that support. Can I can I just add in regards to the national policy question as well? Um, our centre in Queensland with others around the country as well, we're responsible for running a NHMRC funded centre of research excellence in telehealth. And one of the final products of that was a policy futures workshop. And we have produced a report um, which is available online, but I'm very happy to share it on record, um, which does outline some recommendations around that in, in terms of what needs to change and where our opportunities truly are on a national basis. So. Um, I, I think that document would be of interest to the committee. Thank you. Oh, hi, uh, thanks. Um, thanks oh, now, Fiona, yeah, Fiona Phillips, over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, look, thank you uh, for coming in today. I just have some questions um, around uh, bushfires and the Medicare bushfire recovery telehealth uh, initiative. Uh, and I know that was probably like a little bit before COVID, um, I guess, sort of increased and things. Um, I guess I'm wondering from your experience, um, what's been the evidence uh, as to the, the success and the take up of that Medicare bushfire recovery telehealth service? Um, I, I'd have to be honest by saying, look, I'm honestly not sure what the evidence is to date, whether other groups have. I personally, in my research department, haven't explored that. But one of the difficulties is um, whilst we know that the number of Medicare funded services have increased, especially in the era of mental health consultations, um, there's certainly been an increase even before COVID-19 as a result of those targeted um, specific funding exercises. Um, but the problem is, is trying to get information through Medicare that will um, help you articulate which services were received by which patient and what were the actual clinical outcomes. So for obvious reasons around confidentiality, particularly when we're dealing with small groups in smaller areas, it's very hard to get that information and follow them up over time. Um, I suspect as a result of increased access to mental health services, whether they be in person or uh, through a telehealth modality, um, that somebody has been able to access services and that's better than nothing. However, I'm not personally familiar with any specific studies that have examined uh, the actual results of that initiative. Okay. I guess then in terms of um, obviously the bushfires uh, and a lot of that was to be deli delivered through video uh, telehealth and I come from the New South Wales South Coast and I think a lot of those areas um, there's significant issues with the NBN uh, and accessing uh, video uh, telehealth and I guess I'm just wondering um, whether, like, you know, what's your perspective on that in, in rural areas? Whether, um, you know, whether there is enough video bandwidth with there? So, so anecdotally, um, we work with probably about 15 different communities around Queensland, many of them obviously non-metropolitan. 
uh, as far out that New Roma, Mount Isa, up in the Torres Strait. Um, internet connectivity is quite poor in many of those remote areas, and it's also uh, good for five minutes and bad for five minutes. It's unpredictable. Um, it's also very time dependent. Uh, we know with uh, children moving to and from school, we know the hours of the day that we, we don't like to do connections because it just doesn't work. Um, there are also geographically some areas where internet is just not available because you might be on a particular part of an island or in a particular area of a suburb where the internet connection is just not strong enough. So it is contention based. So it means that um, it's obviously subject to demand. And what we have seen in, in quite a few examples is just uh, difficulty in getting a reasonable bandwidth connection. And that does have a flow on impact to not only the patient's experience, but also uh, the patient's experience and desire to do telehealth. If you have a connection which is dropping out or a connection where you're trying to examine a wound or look at somebody's uh, walking ability or gait or um, other, uh, other physical feature, then it is difficult if the call is dropping out or if it's heavily pixelated and distorted. Um, so the quality is very important in the context of a video consultation. So can I just follow up from that? So do you think that's related to, for example, technology changing from, for example, um, fibre to the premises to fibre to the node? Uh, I would say it's a combination of features because in many of the areas we've been working, uh, there hasn't been any internet connection or any reasonable internet connection. It's been a basic satellite telephone um, and that's it. So ha having some connectivity in the communities is a, is a you know, uh, required. So it's, it's welcomed. But um, from that perspective, I, I don't know whether it's specifically related to the, the technique of bringing the internet to the premises. Um, there are certainly... Um, uh, there are certainly advantages to certain approaches, for example, fibre directly to a point of contact rather than using traditional copper lines. But um, from our experience, we've been mainly working in the hospital and health industry area where we've had reasonable internet into the hospital system, um, but very unpredictable internet, whether it be, you know, wireless or in the home. Mm. Okay, that, that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Susan Templeman here. So I'll just um, uh, pick up from that, actually. I'll tell you, it's actually been really fascinating um, hearing the progress and the adoption and the pictures that you painted, because that was the vision of NBN right back at, at its inception. And it, it feels like now it's about identifying the gaps from an NBN perspective, as well as from a broader health system perspective. Is, is that where your heads are at right now? Have I understood correctly? Yeah, I, I think the NBN, you know, the way I describe this to people who ask me health and why has it taken so long to get the I try to look, doing telehealth well is like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. We have all the parts, but we haven't actually put together the entire picture well. And the NBN is one of those parts. Um, it, you know, if you have the NBN and solid, reliable communications, then that's one of the requirements for um, a telehealth consultation. If we're talking about video consultation, remember we are also um, acknowledging that telehealth is more than just that. It is also remote monitoring. It's also telephone interactions. So there's a range of different things. But there's a whole lot more uh, that needs to be put into place. And it's often those other pieces of the puzzle that have never been joined together. Um, we've talked about education and training requirements. We've talked about the difficulty of system integration. Uh, interoperability is really important. How do we share medical records between hospitals and GPs, for example? There are systems in place with some general practices, but not others. How do we collect the information we need at a point of a consultation uh, if it's a patient that we don't normally see and they're in a different health service? So there's a whole range of different things that you require um, and because telehealth involves interactions between more than one person and more than one site, the very nature of it, you're connecting from A to B, um, it's important that all of these systems are well integrated and connected. And currently, we're, we're seeing a, a fairly fragmented system where we're quickly trying to put together the pieces to make them work. And NBN, honestly, is just one of those pieces. Um, in terms of the... You talked about the doctors and clinicians not really wanting to waste time with poor quality video. So 
potentially choosing not even to use that as an option. Um, and it's been we've focused a lot on rural and remote and, and regional areas. I'm only 70 kilometres from the city of CBD of Sydney, but I've got more than 500 houses who don't have uh, any NBN yet, a, a huge patch. So presumably, people on ADSL still uh, are not able to be accommodated um, for telehealth when video is required, or is that not? the case are they is ADSL still able to be yep. you know they can still use it yeah the ADSL is still perfectly reasonable um, one of the findings of a report we submitted for an MBN pilot project many years ago was the fact that um, it's important to understand that telehealth does benefit from high-speed internet but some telehealth services can be delivered using fairly low bandwidth technology um, so we we've supported email based services telephone based services and the important thing is that we match the telehealth modality to the clinical requirements. We don't, we, we don't believe that there is one magical solution that's going to manage every health service. Um, and it's very important that we turn that around and make sure we clearly understand the requirements. I certainly understand what you mean in terms of uh, patches of people not having access to the NBN, but some people do have access to wireless uh, connectivity or basic ADSL and that still works. So. You, you don't need super high speed to be able to do an effective telehealth consultation. So what are the um, the types of consultations then? You've mentioned when you're examining a wound and or you want to see someone's gait and how they're walking. Mm. What are some other examples of things that require high quality video? There's a broad, it's Kim Ford here, there's a broad range of applications for telehealth from being roadside as a paramedic with a body cam talking back to an emergency specialist who can support you. It can be supporting a virtual ICU. So in a smaller hospital that doesn't have the bed numbers for a full-time intensivist can be supported by an intensivist from a bigger hospital. It can be, we have a mental health hospital in the home project. We have um, all sorts of various modalities of delivering healthcare that we deliver by tele that can be delivered by telehealth it's not purely just consultations there's a broad the consultations in the outpatient scenario are our bread and butter but the high value care is in the hospital avoidance and the early discharge and supporting people in the inpatient setting as well and as i say also looking at ambulance as well um, Jackie Plunkett here. I might add to that to say some of the other uh, modalities of telehealth can be um, consumer based, so, and, but we just haven't tapped into them. So, for example, Apple Watches um, that are uh, in the US FDA approved um, with single lead ECGs and heart monitoring. Um, so, and they've got functionality within them that um, they've also got falls detected. So that's one form of uh, consumer-based telehealth. There are others such as an email, a text message. These are also uh, telehealth consultations or can be telehealth consultations. There's also asynchronous telehealth that we haven't actually talked about much. And that's used a lot in ophthalmology and also in uh, dermatology, where an image of the patient's um, lesion or uh, their ears or um, the, the retina uh, forwarded on to a specialist for um, storm forward consultations. So there's a lot of areas that this is significantly better and clinicians, uh, fractures is another one. And um, uh, clinicians can actually do more consultations in a less period of time using simply the images. Um, and that's another form of telehealth um, that we haven't talked about much. I mean, we are, as the NBN committee, we are really focused on the NBN component of it, obviously. Um, so, in terms of the experiences that you're hearing and the evidence you're seeing, uh, what if we were um, trying to improve the 
quality of delivery with with NBN being the centre pin of it. Is it the is it wireless or satellite or fibre to the node? Is there any one or various ones of those where you would prioritise for improvements and upgrading to improve um, the that aspect of the telehealth experience? I'd, I'd probably just say that. Sorry, Kim, Sorry. go ahead. That's a technical question that's probably beyond us or certainly beyond me as a clinician and a deliverer of a service. It's about having reliable, secure internet that doesn't drop out. How we get that is not really the issue. It's just having access to that. I agree with you, Kim. Um, and so does that mean that you haven't looked at what the definition of reliable is, but you're using someone else's definition of that? Reliable for us would be um, it works. It works first time. Uh, it works, uh, you know, very simply. That's what we would deem reliable. And so you don't yeah, talk the about the sort of the sort of speed upload and download times that are required for t for for video um, consultations and the like. I I think the um, technical details are very important. And back in 2011 and 12, as part of that um, introduction of say Medicare funding, there there was a report that we wrote around the technical guidelines and. And we referred to uh, the minimum requirements for an effective telehealth consultation in terms of bandwidth. Um, we, we used around 384 kilobits per second as an absolute minimum for an interaction. There's also some questions around how people deal with latency. Um, so in some areas, satellite communications may be the only option and that may be perfectly fine. Um, some clinicians are a little bit concerned about that because of an obvious delay in communications. But what we've been able to see is that provided people anticipate the delay and know how to manage that delay, um, it can be managed uh, well for a clinical consultation. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, um, the, that all raises one other question then. If a uh, clinician is considering whether a video consultation with a patient is the most appropriate way to do it, do they factor in the type of NBN that that person has? The short answer to that would be no, um, the clinician doesn't, but his administration staff could give some advice um, right. for that. Uh, and, and that then goes to the issue of, you've mentioned the affordability and access. And I just wondered if you had some thoughts on um, the digital literacy component of it and people's ability to use the device that they have. Obviously, some are being very uh, resourceful in finding the places where they can access uh, a good broadband connect connection if they haven't got one themselves. But what about that digital literacy side of it and the ability to use the device that they have in the way that you need them to? There's still a, um, there is still a divide, uh, which a lot of other researchers are now reporting around the world. Uh, we originally thought that there will be certain groups of people disadvantaged um, with the onset or the increase of telehealth, and, and that's not actually true. So one of the myths of telehealth is that it's never gonna suit um, people who are um, technically illiterate or um, older people who have never used the device, but we're actually seeing quite the reverse. We're seeing that with an appropriate training, it's, it's really quite simple where um, if patients are given the appropriate instruction, um, they tend to manage quite well. Um, but we're also seeing people that certainly don't have devices and don't have access to devices and therefore um, they obviously are missing out. But from a point of view of, um, for example, older people using um, devices, uh, many older Australians are using devices all the time to interact with their families, especially during COVID, we see that, but um, it's a regular thing for them. So the idea of seeing their doctor or a nurse or a speech therapist or a physio on their on their iPad or computer is um, may seem obscure to them, but from a video consultation point of view, if they realise it's a one click and connect mm -hmm. approach and they're well supported, then it works well. Mm -hmm. Jackie. Uh 
Uh, can I just ask, um, I did, my physio did talk to me um, in the early days of COVID about him having to go and physically help someone set up and doing a lot of stuff that was not covered by any Medicare item in order to get that person able to be, um, do a consultation remotely. Is, would that be a common experience? Certainly not in my practice. Um, we haven't had to do that. The, the short answer is if there is a complex requirement to set the person up, then you either, if it's from a technical perspective, you go to a telephone, or if it's from a, a, a clinical perspective, you would still do an in-person consultation. I, I still believe that there are a lot of patients that don't have uh, computers and the devices to do that. So um, credit to him for actually going back to the home and making the effort to set it up. Um, I think over time accessibility is going to hopefully improve in terms of um, everyone's ability to access a computer, but we do have to be mindful that there, there are patients that can definitely benefit from telehealth that um, don't have the fundamental requirements, be that NBN or um, specific computer requ uh, requirements or equipment. Uh, just one last question, Chair. Do your uh, um, patients or the patients of the uh, various um, clinicians that you engage with, do they ever, are you aware if they ever recommend a uh, patient to an organisation who can assist them with their digital connection and literacy? Not so much a sell them things, but uh, to assist with the education? Not to my Jackie Plunkett, uh, not to my knowledge. Um, although, having said that, there are a lot of organisations that are using telehealth as a marketing um, mm. capability to encourage more patients to come. Uh, if there was an organisation, there certainly is in my community, which is a, a free service. Um, of volunteers who assist people uh, get connected. Is there, would that be something useful for those organisations to be connecting into um, medical practices so that if it did come up and it's possibly the, the frontline staff who are going to um, pick up um, those issues from time to time, is there, is there a usefulness in that? Absolutely, Jackie Plunkett, um, Telehealth Society. Yes, absolutely. Um, that would be great if we could say, look, we want to do a telehealth consultation and they go, well, we're not too sure if there was an organisation that we could say, oh, look, I'll call the, you know, IT community people and they'll come and help you set that up. That would be great. Mm. Well, if you know anyone in New South Wales needs it, there's an organisation based in Penrith called LEAP, L -E, -E P, which has a tech mates program, which is just brilliant. Thank you, Chair. So, Susan, that's um, one of the pieces of the puzzle in terms of making telehealth work. You know, we, we tend to kind of fall back on technology and equipment and infrastructure, but you know, an important thing is coordination and, and some health systems, I know down in Tasmania, um, I know down in, in Victoria, we've got virtual navigators or navigators that kind of act on behalf of patients and help work out the appropriate connections and provide that additional support. Um, so I think it's really, really important because 20 years ago, there was never that support provided and therefore telehealth only happened with enthusiasts and those that learnt it themselves. But that's why it wasn't widespread. And with good coordination, we've seen many examples around the country and around the world where um, telehealth uptake and, and involvement certainly increases. Mm. Oh, good to hear. Thank you. Chair, I'm going to hand back to you. Have we got your chair? Well, um, in the Stage of coup, Susan. What's that, sorry? Stage of coup. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the absence time, of, um, 
in the absence of the, the, the chair, he may be having technically technical difficulties. It's Dr. Katie Allen here. I don't know if you can see me. I can't see myself for some reason, but can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to preface my comments with the um, information that I'm a medical doctor and have used telehealth frequently uh, in my previous life, um, particularly for regional and rural uh, areas. And um, I think it's worth noting that the increase of 0.2% of um, uh, GP consultations being telehealth moving to 20% is an incredibly transformative aspect of COVID and I think a legacy outcome, hopefully for transformation of health because it's not just distance, um, but also congestion in inner city that means uh, people are, can use uh, telehealth and access their GP and hopefully go and see their doctor earlier in the course of the disease or manage ongoing chronic conditions more reliably. My questions go to the issue of video versus telehealth. Um, and I know that as a professional using telehealth, it was always by video, um, as a special, I was a specialist, a paediatrician, and it is true that it was very clunky and very difficult to use. And in the light of the fact that this is the NBN committee, I was wondering if you could give us um, a bit more detail about the drivers and policy around video versus not. I know we've made some comments about uh, the, the medical side, but I'm interested in the technical side. Um, because um, the, the platforms are very clunky and it seems to me that at the moment the GPs are um, using the telephone with alacrity. And so the first question I have is, uh, do we understand the age of telephone for telehealth versus video for telehealth? Um, and whether uh, younger users are more likely to use telehealth, uh, sorry, more likely to use video health and older people more likely to use telehealth? And is that a device related issue? Jackie Plunkett from the Telehealth Society. Um, it's quite funny. Um, we're finding that um, within the acute sector, uh, we expected that it was probably gonna be the younger generation coming through that were more um, encouraged to use video technologies um, and in actual fact um, it's the older generation that are transforming well that's been my experience um, in relation to in the GP environment I think we're just not there yet I think it's too early um, and there, there just needs to be a little bit of a shift in our thinking around using video uh, there, as a, as a medical um, expert, there was a shift to go from face-to-face um, -face consultations to telehealth consultations. When I first started, I was very, you know, let's, you know, let's do telehealth and all my GPs said, absolutely no way. Um, I could probably only do 10% of my patients that way. Um, they're now seeing, well, I have one GP that only does telehealth consultations. So um, telephone consultations. As we progress, and so in the last month, we've now got them actually asking for video because the concept of telehealth is actually, they've gotten over that barrier and now they're wanting to explore it more. And um, so can I just interrupt you for a moment because the question about the technical side, could you explain for the committee about the telehealth, the video health aspect um, as a you know, tele, uh, IT ignorant person, I don't understand why doctors can't use FaceTime or WhatsApp instead of a phone and why do they have to use a, tele, a video health platform for security and privacy or is there a possibility if they're using a phone, why can't they just use FaceTime or WhatsApp? which is clearly adds an extra dimension very easily to the uh, interaction with the doctor. So there is a lot of work that's been done on this and the Centre uh, for Online Health actually have done some significant work and I actually might get um, Anthony Smith to talk to you about standard space. But one of the things before I hand to him is it's about consent. Um, if you want to use, for example, uh, we don't recommend using Skype or WhatsApp or non-standard space technologies um, simply because there's no security around them. However, if you explain that to both the clinician and the patient um, and allow the patient and the clinician to have that consent, 
then there's no reason you couldn't use them. So, for example, if my child has a rash and the only thing I've got to use is FaceTime, um, I'm going to allow that to happen because I don't mind if that gets into the general public. But if you're going to talk to me about a mental health or a women's health issue, I probably want something more secure. Um, so can you explain a little bit about that? Because a phone that is using a, vi a visual aspect, so if I'm using a phone, that's not secure. You add FaceTime. Why is it more or less secure? So I'll hand over to Anthony Smith. They've done some of the um, work around um, security. Um, Anthony, would you mind answering that? Um, you know, the, from a security perspective, I'm kind of with you in the sense that, you know, as a clinician, you want to choose the most appropriate modality to see your patients. And whether it be FaceTime or Skype or one of those um, processes, then that, that ought to be perfect to use some of the common off-the-shelf software applications that's been related to security and privacy. So it's mainly, you know, you don't know whether this call can be intercepted. Um, but from a technical perspective, and I'm not a technician, but it's actually true that a telephone consultation can be intercepted as well. So there, there is a greater risk in doing a Skype consultation and having someone intercept. I don't know what that risk is. I think it's extremely small, but because the privacy requirements are not made very clear by the supplier of that software, um, most recommendations tend to say don't use it. What's practically happening... The, so I suppose the concerns I have is that the perfect gets in the way of the good from a technical privacy point of view when people are already exposing themselves. And this is what often happens. People won't provide information and yet they're already providing a huge amount of information by their mobile phone. It's Kim Ford here. There's also legislative requirements around where the traffic from the internet or the traffic from the call can be routed that needs to stay within Australia to satisfy legislative requirements. And phone stays within Australia is my understanding, whereas you can't guarantee that video, because it's web-based, will actually stay within the country. So a lot of it is, I think, legislative driven. That's extremely helpful for me to understand that, just because from a medical point of view, the difference in you know, cost and ease of access. Um, there, as a doctor, I know that there's a lot of uh, body language, uh, unsaid things that you can get from a video that you can't get from a telephone. And I do note the comments about tele-triaging. Um, often tele-triaging can just be done over the phone, but most doctors will tell you that a first time you see someone is the best time to have a quality interaction. You might notice the way they're limping as they walk in, or you might notice that they're dishevelled and you might ask them about how they're sleeping at night. So there's a lot of information you get and as a paediatrician, that information uh, is often not, cannot be triggered by asking um, unless you can visually see something. And paediatricians use visual tools with their interactions more than even adults, uh, adult physicians. And so I'm interested that you, it is the security of the web-based aspect and the legislation around that. That's very, very helpful. Thank you. I might, just, so, um, I might just say that the reverse is also true. You you talk about a patient who comes into your, um, to your practice, but also to be able to beam into a patient's home um, to see how they live um, is also sort of very important to that. And it's probably an aspect that you don't get to see. That's right. But I can understand the privacy around those aspects. But if we were to sort of have a consenting process where people are informed that, you know, make sure you're in, in a place that you, you don't, you know, you'll be aware of what's behind you. So there can be a consenting process before the video. But it seems to me um, that the underutilisation of the video may, from a medical point of view, be a problem long term. But from a technical side of things, you've explained why there may be a uh, legislative reason why we need to be concerned about it. I suppose the only um, other question I have with regards to that is uh, the potential for um, fraud um, if we're using telephones and, um, for instance, triaging being undertaken by another member of a team. Is there any un understanding or information about that? Because in some ways, um, you know, we there could be a potential for fraud because the patient doesn't know who the doctor is that they're seeing. Uh, they can't see them visually. So there's probably two aspects to that that I could answer. One is about um, identifying a patient and making sure you've got the right patient, someone trying to receive a health service and falsifying 
identity is is one issue. Um, so I suspect the process actually engage with the patient and gets that information. So that would be one. Um, the other area around fraud is in relation to um, over-servicing, and, and that comment has come up before too, but my general thought on that is that the same mechanisms should apply to telehealth as they do in face-to-face. -face. There, there are already processes in place to pick up fraudulent activity, perhaps due to volume of services or recurrence of services, and, and I think exactly the same rules should apply to the telehealth world. But presumably from it, and I'm getting back to the in, the NBN point of this, because I, I could go on a long time about the telemedicine side of it, which I'm particularly interested in. But um, from the technical side, um, my understanding is it's not like there is any oversight about um, how much time someone is really spending with um, a patient. So in theory, a, a physician or a GP could have three nurses triaging under their supervision and the government would not be aware of that if they were even happening in parallel in real time because there's not access to the um, telecommunications uh, data that's being derived. It's hard for a doctor to do that in a physical sense because there are patients in the waiting room and they can identify that they've actually seen the doctor. But if I was a female doctor and the three female nurses who were doing telephone tri triaging, there could be fraud around that presumably. I'd be tempted to say that the same processes would still apply, but I'm, I'm happy to be wrong as well. But I think in terms of telehealth, there, there are processes in place where uh, you can legitimately have nurse practitioners or practice nurses involved in a consultation and a GP can be involved. And some of the examples I see are where nurses are becoming case managers and a GP will um, participate in, a, in part of the consultation, not all of it. And that's been more an efficiency process within a general practice. Um, but again, you know, whether you're able to sweep through a thousand patients in a day in the face to face kind of situation, um, the, the same kind of rules should apply to someone who claims they can do that by telehealth. But uh, I, I'm not a GP, so I also respect your perspective as well. And also, as Kim Ford here, if there were to be an MBS investigation, computer logs and things should be auditable. And you should be able to get IP addresses to be able to track what was happening. So if you could see there were synchronous consultations happening and, and the like. So there should be some some ability to audit. So for instance, like, if a GP like was, was ringing, every, ringing a lot of patients every one minute, kind of, you know, almost sort of uh, phone canvassing patients, that would be auditable, would it? Because if you could look at, look at phone records. In the old days, I don't know whether you remember, you used to get a list of every call you made and how long you stayed on a call. So, so, the, so from that regard, you, it would be auditable. So do you understand whether that is part of the current policy or not? For MBS, I wouldn't know. It's not part of the policy to be able to audit the phone records or the, um, the video records, um, but it is still as in the face-to-face -face consult where the patient, uh, where the GP may have their record open for that time. Um, the standard practice, as I'm sure you're aware, is they review the patient's record before they come in, they have the consultation, the patient leaves and they do the patient notes or do the patient notes during. So it would be in the same. Great, thank you. No more questions. Thank you very much for that. Perrin, I think you might be going to ask a question now. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll take I'll take over from there. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, I'm interested to understand. I know I mean telehealth. The concept of telehealth has been around for a long time, and it's not limited to just um, medical telehealth. We've got a range of allied health professionals that um, also make broad use of it. Um, you said that GP telehealth use has gone from 2% to 20% since the pandemic. Have we also seen a similar increase in um, allied health use of telehealth or was it already um, fairly well established prior to the pandemic? I could probably say something in regards to the MBS data, but then Kim would be in a good position to talk about it from a public sector perspective. 
certainly seen a massive um, growth in the amount of activity being done involving nurse practitioners, um, also allied health consultations, and also non-medical medi uh, mental health consultations. So um, again, these numbers are available in these reports on the website, um, but a synthesis of the MBS data will say that um, just between March and June, over 61,000 consultations were done involving nurse practitioners and about 20% of those were done by telehealth. And amongst the allied health consultations, um, over a million were done in that time frame, and about 5% of those were done by telehealth, so slightly less in the private sector area. But the story is quite different um, in the public sector, and maybe Kim wants to say something about um, Tasmania Health. So we've found that the uptake from allied health and nursing has been quite good. There is certainly doctors and keen to be able to continue providing care during these COVID times. So we've got a number of different models, tele-rehab, um, antenatal classes, child health and parenting, wound care, etc. So it has been taken up by allied health and nursing to probably a greater degree than, because the time pressure doesn't seem to be there for allied health and nursing as much as it does for the medical practitioners in the outpatient setting. Because they come in and they're waiting, you know, the turnover is is the pressure. Mm. Um, and I note that your organisation was established in 2008, which was almost about the time we commenced with the rollout of the NBN. So in that time or over that time, um, have you, how have you seen the, um, the NBN playing a role in the capacity for um, telehealth services? From a technical perspective, absolutely crucial. Um, there were programs that were put out by the Department of Broadband um, also uh, in the uh, around that time uh, for the Digital Regions Initiative, would actually, uh, which actually are still being utilised today. Um, so those initiatives actually helped to uh, kickstart some of the telehealth activity. The National Broadband Network um, has also, as I alluded to earlier, been instrumental in getting billing for uh, specialist consults. Um, for example, it was Senator Conroy um, back in 2009, 2010, that advocated with, um, from a report that was done by NICTA um, in 2009, um, that the Telehealth Society had input into around how can you expect GPs to use telehealth, how can you expect to transform um, healthcare without remunerating these new innovative models? So um, funnily enough, you've been not only transformative from the technical perspective, but you've also been very transformative from helping to drive change within the government from a policy and funding perspective. Um. And further to that, um, with the rollout of SkyMuster in the regions, I, I note when SkyMuster was in its early days, there were a lot of uh, issues with its effectiveness and, and the uh, capacity. There was um, a, a, a lot of arguments that it wasn't up to scratch. But um, as time has progressed, SkyMuster seems to be uh, widely accepted um, in the regions, and, and I'm a SkyMuster customer myself. Is is the SkyMuster service adequate for the telehealth services that we provide in rural, regional, and remote communities? No. Um. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> what can we do to improve it? Like, what what more uh, needs to be done in those uh, areas? Well, from a technical perspective, I can't tell you, uh, other than we need the um, reliability and also the, um, I think mainly the reliability, um, but also it's um, uh, bandwidth capacity. So within our submission, we talked about um, uh, something, uh, there was a community just outside of Alice Springs, which is a rural community that, uh, 
couldn't um, have access to telehealth services simply because the bandwidth wasn't sufficient. And when you're talking about, as um, Anthony alluded to earlier, um, you know, needing as low as 386, uh, then, you know, that's still not enough. Uh, the sky must is still not providing enough. Um, can I comment on that as well? Um, can I ask a question? So in terms of you being a SkyMuster customer, do you find um, the latency to be an issue when you're communicating with people or not? Uh, I've, I've, done a, I've done a few of these um, sort of hearings on, on my SkyMuster service at home. I'm not on the SkyMuster today. I'm, I'm in town in, in the office, but I, I have done them at home. And um, I actually must admit, I have not struck a problem um, with the latency. The only times I've actually even noticed it is um, if I've done a TV interview, it seems to be three seconds behind. Um, but yeah, I, I, I haven't noticed it, but I'm also not conducting um, you know, a, a time sensitive medical uh, um, facility. But I also, I do know some allied health professionals that um, occupational therapists and speech therapists who uh, deal predominantly in telehealth in regional and remote communities. I haven't had that feedback from them. Again, it's a, it's a different level of service. So I am very interested to hear uh, your thoughts on, on how how we can improve it and what we need. Yeah, part of, part of the, the pragmatic kind of view is that I think we're going to end up with different techniques of providing broadband to people for obvious geographic reasons. Um, and, and I think that's just going to be the nature of it. I'm very interested in understanding what people's experience and there hasn't been any research that I'm aware of that has actually explored it from a clinician or a patient perspective, the use of, for example, SkyMuster. Um, mm. The latest is normally an issue, but the important uh, point I made before is that whatever the technology is, as long as it matches the clinical requirements and it's appropriately in place, and we need to think of what the clinical problem is first before we get too excited about the actual technology. But if, if SkyMuster is being used and if we know that there's latency, then the important thing to do then is just make sure that people are well aware of it and people are trained on how to deal with it. Um, and then from a clinical perspective, um, that would certainly assist with the effectiveness of a consultation. But there is an opportunity just in that question of doing a little bit more work to better understand if there are some limitations or things that we need to be aware of. Uh, okay, and that's, that's all from me, Chair. Thanks, Senator Davey. Can you hear me now? Yep. Hallelujah. I won't say the other word. Um, Senator Connolly, uh, Mr. Connolly, over to you. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Chair. I'm not sure whether that's a promotion or a, or a demotion. Uh, I, I won't answer <laughs> that. Certainly a that demotion, phrase. mate. I, I, won't, I won't answer that for um, Look, uh, thanks, thanks, Chair. And um, uh, I hope this question uh, uh, hasn't already been covered. My phone dropped out, but it wasn't the NBN. It was definitely user error um, by hitting the wrong button. But look, um, I was just interested to know, um, and I, I think like. Uh, Senator Griff, I uh, uh, had had my first telehealth com uh, consultation recently by phone, uh, but I was wondering, with respect to our GPs around the country, uh, what sorts of NBN plans they're using. And I, um, obviously, just, we've just heard a bit uh, from Senator uh, Davey about about SkyMuster, but just interested in what sort of spread we're seeing of, of uh, NBN plans being used by. Uh, GPs, so, so what sort of broadband plans, um, and any feedback that we might have as to um, how they're functioning. From a GP within rural um, uh, regional Victoria, we're certainly on just a, um, we're on a 20 meg uh, bandwidth uh, connection through to a local provider on the MBN. Um, and our other sites are on 50 megs, so not all of them can actually have connectivities. We are a larger GP practice. Um, the, within regional uh, Victoria, certainly, uh, there are a lot of GPs that are even on something as simple as a consumer-grade um, 
plan. So, you know, like $100 a month uh, plans. So there, there's a lot of private GPs just running off consumer grade um, connections. Oh, thanks for that. And, and, and in terms of, of, of feedback, um, have you received any feedback as to um, how well those plans are functioning for them to deliver services? Uh, the, some of those would be services that wouldn't be delivering, utilising video. Um, for Not for the NBN particularly reason, maybe more for the usability reasons. Um, so I think that emerging once they start to um, use it in a more um, robust way, there could be issues, um, particularly in times where industry is heavily using, um, you know, when we go back to what a COVID normal uh, would look like, when industry is hitting the network hard, and then we've also got GPs who are hitting the network hard, um, that could change, the congestion would change. Thank you for those answers and uh, back to you, Chair, and others. Thanks. I'm going to go and send to Antic, but can I just interrupt along similar lines? I mean, in April this year, the, the Health Minister uh, announced uh, upgrade free upgrades to 50 megabit per second plans for GP clinics. Uh, it, is what I'm hearing the suggestion that not all clinics have availed themselves of that free um, capacity upgrade? Uh, I can't tell you definitely. However, anecdotally, um, I, I would say that there are some who haven't simply because A, they may not have known, B, you know, there's just a lack of understanding why, why increase it when what I've got is fine. Um, but it depends on their literacy, their IT literacy of their organisation. Is that something that the Telehealth Society gets engaged in, kind of communicating with GP networks about these possibilities? Uh, we communicate with our members um, about uh, some of the changes and, and opportunities around telehealth, um, but not with the private health networks themselves. So, for example, you wouldn't have any visibility on what the average... Um, or typical broadband plan is in a GP clinic across the country, for example, no, 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 none of that data? Absolutely not. And I would be uh, go out on a limb to say that not even the primary health network would actually have that information. No, I was just interested because before you were, talk, someone was talking about RNET and the educational kind of thing. Um, I'm just wondering, one of the real issues this community committee is looking at is the the proper and best utilisation of MBN and if I'm hearing that GP clinics who I think would do well to be on a commercial grade plan are, are, are operating on retail plans, um, often the experience is relative to the nature of the service, you know. Um, anyway, um, over to you, Senator Antic. Um, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, good. Thank you. Um, look, I've got a bit of a question. I'm interested in these SkyMaster satellites, and I think we touched a little bit on them uh, earlier, but they seem to have been pretty important in terms of uh, rural health uh, and access um, for, from rural areas to essential health services, which I guess previously were only available if you were you know, jump in the car and, uh, and drive. So but with the, the recent improvements to the NBN satellite services, have you, have you seen... Um, a, a shift, uh, we've well, seen a, a sort of a demonstrable shift to uh, telehealth uptake in the bush. There, there's definitely a, you know, I, you can't attribute it to just the Sky Muster as a form of um, delivering the broadband, but from a general perspective, nationally, we've seen a, a, definitely a big increase in telehealth activity, probably more so since 2011 and 12 because of the introduction of those Medicare numbers. So. Um, in terms of access, that access is primarily being focused on people in rural and remote areas. Um, and more recently, we're seeing um, the advantages of providing a whole range of telehealth services to people who are in metropolitan areas as well, for some of the other reasons we mentioned before, in terms of accessing services. So 
uh, definitely more people um, in regional areas are accessing health services or ha have more reliable access um, because of the improvements in the system. Um, and that includes both the technology, but also the funding and some of the other initiatives that have been put in place. Thank you. Can I, can I build on that same centre antic? Um, we, we've heard today the evidence being, you know, some fraction of a percent uh, of consultations occurring pre-COVID in a telehealth environment to 20%. Is that data broken down or can it be broken down metro versus regional? Um, um, if you can't it, today or now and answer the question, is it available to be provided on notice? I just think it would be valuable to understand Clearly, we've heard there's, there, there's an acceleration in the take-up, which is fantastic. I'd like to, to track the speed of the take-up with respect to metropolitan consultations versus regional consultations. Is that possible? So, so all, all of the data that we're using for our report is um, through publicly reported data through the Medicare site, MBS Online. Um, yep. it, it is possible I can organise for my research team to see if they can um, separate that data according to uh, regional status and we could classify it according to regional and remote and to metropolitan. That'd be awesome. I think that'd be very valuable. Um, I'm not sure whether you'd be able to classify it also by technology type as in fibre to the home versus satellite versus other, but no, I'm seeing good, good, nice try, Charlie. No. People shaking their heads. Fair enough. Um, that would now, be great information um, to have. Yeah, no, I think if we've got it, effectively, if we've got it regional versus, then I think that that's a good start in terms of um, the take up. Um, now, la last thing, um, from my perspective anyway, um, what has the feedback been about the capacity of the MBN to, to meet the needs over the last six months during this pandemic through um, your society? Um, and have you done any thinking about where we would be uh, if we didn't have the MBN? Now, I appreciate a lot of the consultations are taking place by telephone, but you know, have you done any thinking about that? Um, Jackie Plunkett speaking. Uh, from uh, when we initially wanted to come and talk to you in regards to this, we actually specifically asked for feedback um the metro areas were very quiet um because nothing to complain about here um our uh, rural areas south australia tasmania um uh, and northern territory all had something to say in relation to the fact that they're still not getting there now i'd like to say that without the nbn i don't think we would have had this transformation overnight like we did um Despite the fact that we're not using video, we still have some level of trust that there is something there. Um, and if we want to take it further, we can. Uh, you know, I think it's, you know, we've got 80% that are pretty happy. And I think that we will probably um, advance more to uh, video-based telehealth in the next 12 months. I can definitely see it growing, provided the NBS doesn't get pulled out from under us. Um, it depends on what those policy changes are. We're just starting to get faith and trust. Um, let's keep going, would be my advice. Excellent. Well, um, we're two minutes away from our conclusion. So what I'll say is, um, um, but we'll now conclude our proceeding. I want to take um, this opportunity um, to thank our witnesses, in particular to you, Ms Plunkett, to you, Ms Ford, and to you, Professor Smith, for being so generous with your time. Um, um, it is obviously an issue of real um, importance to us. Um, that's why we are specifically to talk with you about um, the MBN and its, its interface with telehealth and telemedicine uh, in light of the pandemic, but also um, where we're headed into the future. You have been asked to provide some material on notice and um, if it isn't too inconvenient, if that could be provided to the Secretariat by the 9th of November, uh, that would be fantastic. I also want um, 
to thank Hansard uh, for their assistance today, broadcasting, uh, as well as um, Secretariat, who uh, have dutifully sat in Parliament House um, doing all the admin on our behalf. Um, to colleagues on the line, can I remind you that we're going straight into a private briefing? Um, and with that, can I thank um, you again uh, for your evidence um, and wish you uh, a happy day and a safe one. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, thanks Anthony. Thank you. Goodbye. I, I declare the hearing adjourned. Thank you.